Anyways, John chapter 8, let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for just this morning, Lord, just another chance to sit at your feet, God, and, and learn from you. Lord, to take a break from all the crazy distractions and things in life that are going on right now. We could turn on the news and probably be worried till we're sick, um, but it wouldn't, do us a, uh, it wouldn't do us anything. And so, Lord, I pray that uh, whatever's trying to bog us down, whatever's trying to distract us right now, we would just cast that at your feet, knowing that you're on the throne, you're in control um, as we receive from you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So John chapter 8, um, as we we continue in this section, this is really the end of Jesus' life. Um, most scholars say this is about six months before he goes to the cross. Um, so it's, in the book, in the Gospel of John, it's not like the other Gospels where they give, um, you know, a, a big overview of Jesus' ministry. Um, John is actually very concise. Um, he, he, he really gives most of the book of John as the end of Jesus' ministry. Um, and so, um, that's why we're only in chapter 8, and we're already at the, towards the end of his ministry here. Um, but as we continue on in this section, um, he is in the temple. He's talking with Jews. He's talking with Pharisees, um, who are also Jews, but, you know, they thought they were better Jews. <laughs> um, talking with the religious leaders, um, even the mixed multitudes at times. And as we saw last week, Jesus, and we're going to see this week, Jesus is going to make a distinction between the man who follows him and the people, in this case, who think they do. And really this is a, str a very strong and bad epidemic amongst churches today, especially in America, especially in the South. There's a lot of people who think that they're following Jesus. There's a lot of people who think that God is on their side. There's a lot of people who think that they're in good standing with the Lord for all the other reasons. See, you have people who fill, fill the pews, but they haven't themselves been filled with the Spirit. And Jesus is going to rebuke those that say they are on God's side, yet despise his son. And usually you find when people are, oh, I'm on God's side, I'm on God's side. But you bring up the name Jesus and it kind of makes them cringe a little bit. They're like, yeah, I'm not like that into Christianity. <laughs> well, Jesus is going to rebuke those people who are like, look, if you, if, if you don't believe in me, then you're really not believing in anything. And what Jesus is also going to teach in this section as we finish up this chapter is a very important thing um, commonly found throughout the whole Bible. It isn't just a Jesus thing. It isn't just a New Testament thing. It's something from the Old Testament. Actually, from the beginning in, in the uh, garden all the way up till um, even Revelation that we find throughout the Bible that our fruit or our works will really show who we belong to. Or our fruit will show what kind of tree we are. You know, if you say you're an orange tree, orange tree, and there's lemons coming off your branches, then either you're lying or you got some weird oranges. And so Jesus is going to talk about that. So let's let's see what he has to say. Enough of what I have to say. John, verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, "If you abide in my word, you are my, my disciples indeed." And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So Jesus starts this next session section by speaking directly to the people who believed in him. He says to the Jews who believed in him. See, this is one of Jesus' main ministries while here on this earth. A lot of people like to get it twisted and, or, or, or say different things. But this was one of Jesus' main ministries. He always took the time to pour into and teach his 12 disciples and any others that wanted to listen. Jesus didn't say, hey disciples, you already believe so you don't need me anymore. I need to build a bigger following and get more people and reach out to all of these people. He didn't neglect the people that wanted to hear him. Instead, he said in John 6, 37, 
All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Jesus here in John 6 is actually saying that he's not out trying to get as many people, but he says, God's already given me the people that I'm supposed to have. And that in itself is a very important lesson for not just pastors um, with their congregations, although that's a, a main thought in it, but just any of us who might be discontent with what we have in the Lord. Lord, I want something bigger. I want something greater. I want more influence. I, I need to, to reach out to more people. Do this and do that. Jesus was content with 12 fishermen from Galilee, one of who was going to betray him. And he knew it. He wasn't, I need to build a bigger, I need 36 disciples. We need to triple in three months. If we don't triple, then all our funding's coming away. You know? And I need to, he was just content with the people that were willing to listen to him. The believers. Jesus wasn't seeker friendly necessarily. That's a, that's a, it's a, a church term nowadays where churches really cast aside believers and just focus on the lost, which is not a bad thing to reach out to the lost, but when your main focus is just the lost people, then again, you're going to neglect the believers, and the believers will never grow. But see, Jesus cared more about making disciples, which is what he commissioned his disciples to go do, not converts, disciples, which is a relationship which is a growth process. And Jesus really cared for these guys. Now he never, again, he never cast away anyone that came, like he says there in John six thirty seven. and anyone who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. I mean, even the Pharisees and Sadducees and religious leaders who he knew were just trying to trap him, who he knew were trying to make a fool out of himself, whom they were making fools out of themselves. He still took time to, some, to answer them. Still had conversations with them. Still preached to them. But his main ministry was those 12 disciples. And look what those 12 disciples ended up doing. In church history, um, you know, again, besides Judas, <laughs> you could say the 11 disciples. Those 11 disciples really, they started missions, they started churches. They were amazing men of God, and women even. The women that believed in the Lord, Jesus poured out into them as well. If there was one person listening, Jesus was okay with it. But, right now Jesus is speaking to, really you could say, new believers. And what is the one thing? What does Jesus tell the people that believe, that have just believed in him? Does he say, go on a missions trip. Join a small group. Take a new believers class. Here, read this book that I just wrote. In a sense, he's going to say that. <laughs> you guys need to get on, you know, pastors. Oh, you got to read this book that I just wrote. It'll tell you how to, how to be a Christian. He tells them the single most important thing that every Christian, no matter how old in the faith you are, should know and do, which is in verse 40, 31, abide in my word. To abide in his word, the Bible. That is the program God has for his children. It's not a 12-step, you know, again, it's not, I, I know a lot of great churches that do, you know, mission, obviously None of these things are bad things. Mission trips are awesome. Small groups are awesome. I know a lot of churches who do the new believers classes and, and they really help people. Um, especially the ones that at least I know of. They, they, their main point is read the word. <laughs> but that's the program God has for his children. Read my word. Abide, abide in my word. Two, two different translations of this verse 31. The Amplified says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, hold fast to my teachings, and live in accordance with them, 
you are truly my disciples. Weist's expanded translation of the New Testament says, Then Jesus was saying to the Jews who having believed in him were at that moment maintaining a faith, As for you, if you remain in the word which is mine, truly my disciples you are. So Jesus here is already talking about fruit. He's saying even as a new believer, there should be fruit in your life already. And he says, if you're abiding in my word. See, we are made, and then he says that you are the truth, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. See, we are made free by the word of God, not the word of man. And people too often nowadays will take the word of man over the word of God. Again, they're they're a new believer, and again they say, Oh, well, I need to read that book or take this program or do these twelve steps or do these, you know things but really it's the word of God and Jesus in Matthew 4 4 says um, he's actually saying this to the devil as the devil is trying to tempt him most of you guys know this story but he answered and said it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God so Jesus telling the devil and even proclaiming here is that the word of God sustains us as a child of God. It's our food. Spiritually, it's our food. We have to eat it. If you want to, you know, just like for those of you who have kids, you know, I mean, I've, kids, they get to a certain age and they don't want to eat, you know, don't want to eat their vegetables, or they just don't want to eat at all. They just want to play, 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 play. And so, hey, if you want to grow up to be big and strong, what do you got to do? You got to eat those vegetables, even if they're nasty. You got to eat all your dinner, even if you don't want to. And now us as adults, having done that, not being malnourished and being able to grow up big and strong, we understand that. That's why we tell our kids that. Like, look, I had to do it too, and I didn't like it, but now look where I am. <laughs> I'm big and strong, and I'm mature. And it's the same thing spiritually. Even for us mature Christians, it's who have been in the faith for, if, whether you've been in the faith for 30 or 40 years, it's still hard sometimes to get up in the morning and read your word. Or maybe you don't do it in the morning, but do it at night or during the day. Whatever, whenever you, your time is, it's still hard. But we need it. And then we see that the Jews were confused because they, they thought they were already free. Like, they answered, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. Which was a lie because if you know this, the history of Israel, they were pretty much always in bondage. They started out because they were in bondage. That's how <laughs> Israel became a nation. They were slaves in Egypt. And then from that point on, their sins led them into more bondage and more bondage and more bondage. And in fact, when they were saying this, they were in bondage to Rome. They didn't have uh, the authority to, to have capital punishment, which is what we talked about um, before when they brought the, the woman um, caught in adultery. And so this is just a lie. And it's crazy when people um, are confronted with the truth, how they'll just start making things up to get out of it. <laughs> We're not in bondage as they're shackled. It's, and it, again, they were confused because they thought they were already free because they were Abraham's descendants. And, and when I was reading this, it really reminded me of, of our country. <laughs> You know, telling an American today, hey, you'll be made free. I'm already, I'm already free. I'm an American. Freedom of speech, freedom of, you know, I don't need Jesus to make me free. I live in America, right? It's sad that so many people, Americans, still think that way. So many Americans think that America is God's chosen nation. 
that this is basically the kingdom. <laughs> because they're Americans, that they're, they're better standing in God, with God. But see, what Jesus is saying here is actually the message of the, of the cross, that we are slaves to sin, and if we obey its lusts and desires, that we are slaves to sins if we obey its lusts and desires, but Jesus came to make us free from it completely. He says there, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And in the Greek, he's actually saying anyone who purposes to sin. Like they wake up in the morning like, all right, I'm going to sin today. My, the purpose of my life is to sin. Now, obviously, most people don't say that out loud, but they live it that way. Okay, how am I going to get drunk tonight? How am I going to get high? How am I going to please my sexual desires? How am I going to get more money? How am I going to live the American dream? How am I going to... They purpose in their heart to do that. I don't care who falls in the way, who gets in my way. I'm going to do what I want to do. But see, a true child of God will not live a life that's purpose is to sin. Because a true child of God, their purpose is to please God. And so Jesus is telling them, look. And we're going to see here in a second. In verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell, you, and if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore you do not hear because you are not of God. And so here we actually have Jesus judging of people who are so dependent upon their works, by their works. And he says, look, the only deeds that you have, the only fruit that you have produced can only come from one source. The only tree that you are, the only thing that you're rooted in, is the devil. Jesus tells them right now, they are sons of the devil. Sons of Satan. A murderer, a liar, a stealer. Paul in Romans 2.12 says, For as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And as many have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. See, these Jews wanted to hold the law up as, and they did hold it up as sacred. And it was proceeding from the mouth of God. But they thought they were perfect before it. And Jesus says, all right, if, if you want to say that you keep the whole law, let me judge you by the law. Let me judge you by the thing that you claim to keep perfectly. And he says, you guys, you guys are trying to kill me, <laughs> first off. And we're going to see there at the end of this chapter that they actually do physically try and kill him. Attempted murder. He says, look, you guys, are, you guys are breaking the very thing that you say you keep perfectly. Just like the young rich ruler when he came to Jesus. And he says, oh, I've kept the law perfectly since my youth. I haven't done anything. So Jesus says, okay, sell all, sell all you have and give, to the poor, give the money to the poor. And 
And honestly, Jesus was pointing out the greed in his heart. The envy. Which was breaking the law. Jesus was pointing out no man is perfect. See, they wanted to be held up against the law and they were found lacking. And then he tells them that because of the sin in their life, that his word has no place in them. See, one of the best ways to see if the word of God is taking root is in a changed life. Again, you, you might have many people who, who, who say they're believers, but there's no change in their life. See, saying a prayer or going up front during an altar call saves no one, but believing in the word of Christ does. And there's many people who say, well, I, yeah, I raised my hand when the pastor said, does anyone want to be saved? Or I said the sinner's prayer. And I went to that, on that missions trip. And I go to church every Sunday and my name's in the church directory. It's been there for 30 years and my dad was the, used to be the pastor at that church. But Jesus here says, look, you can't say you believe in God and live a life full of sin. It doesn't work that way. But see, Christians, we're not off the hook either. This isn't just for non-believers. Christians, how many times have we read the Bible or listened to a sermon and come away unchanged? See, the, the question, are you letting the Word of God take root in your life to produce fruit? If you have sin in your life, that you are letting run your life, the word cannot take root. It can't. We let our sin get in the way of, of you know, so, sometimes people will say, oh, I haven't heard from God in so long. But I've also been getting drunk every night and passing out and going to bed. Maybe he's been trying to speak to you. <laughs> you just couldn't hear him or couldn't remember. But sin in our life will, will cause us to not let the Word of God take root in our lives. Because we're so focused on our desires, on our passions, on our lusts, on sin's desires. That when we're listening to sin... We can't also be listening to God because it's going to go in different directions. It's not going to be alongside or kind of parallel. It's totally different directions. Okay, I'm going to go sin while I listen to God. It, it doesn't work that way. It will, it will not work that way. And Jesus tells them that the fruit of the Pharisees is the same fruit that was produced by Adam and Eve once they listened to the devil in his lies. This fruit that they had is that they became, Jesus saw their actions and said, look, I know who your father is by your actions. You might say you're a child of God, but what does your life say? What does your fruit say? Simply saying it. I mean, G again, Jesus, Jesus even said that people will, will come knocking on the door of heaven saying, Father, we preached in your name, we prophesied in your name, we healed in your name, we cast out demons in your name. And Jesus says, get away from me. I never knew you. Just because someone says Jesus' name doesn't mean that he is their Lord. In verse 48, Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do, I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead, and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. 
And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. At this point, the Jews are getting tired of him telling, telling him that they don't know God. Again, maybe you guys have experienced this with someone who professes to be a Christian, family member, friend, co-worker, and yet their life is just a lifestyle of sin. And it, not in like a mean way, like you're not a Christian, but in a way of, of trying to point them back to the Lord. You're trying to look. You say you're a Christian, but your life does not lead it. So naturally, once someone does not have a valid argument for the truth, they turn to name calling, right? Again, maybe this has happened to you. You judger. You think you can judge me, and you hypocrite. And Well, Jesus encountered the same ridicule. He was called a Samaritan, which we've talked about before when Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well. The Samaritan wasn't just a type of people. It was also a... Uh, um, a bad name to be called. And also, you have a demon. You, you know, you demonically possess Samaritan. We don't have to listen to you. And see, they, they said he had a demon, which was actually not the first time. In Mark 3, the Pharisee says that he cast out demons by Beelzebub. And Jesus, you know, in that, in that encounter said, a house divided itself cannot stand. Why, why would the devil cast out his own demons when his demons are doing his work? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and at this time, you know, I, Jesus doesn't even really talk to them about that. But again, Jesus points to the fact that he honors God. Fruit that you are doing God's work and are his child is that you will honor him and not yourself. The works that you do, do they honor God or do they honor you? If they honor God, then that's fruit. That's good fruit. That's the fruit that you are a child of God. But see, if you honor yourself, then what kind of fruit is that? I don't think that's godly fruit. Jesus never sought his own glory, but only the Father's. It says there in verse 49, I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. I do not seek my own glory, but there is one who seeks and judges. And he says, look, you're going to have to answer to God. And then in verse 51, he gives us he gives the true hope of every believer. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. A better place, knowing that this earth, this body, is not the end all, be all. See, this frustrated them because Abraham and the prophets were dead. They say that. Abraham's dead, the prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? He claimed to conquer the one thing that no man can conquer. Not even Abraham, Moses, the prophets, anyone. Especially themselves. But see, even Abraham believed in the resurrection power of God. In Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19... Um, talking about the faith of Abraham, it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac... And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. You remember this, that story when Abraham and Isaac 
uh, are about to walk up to the mountain, he says to his servants, he says, stay here, for me and the boy will return. Knowing that Abraham, Abraham knew his intentions were to go up there and to offer up Isaac, because God had told him to. And yet he said to his own servants, me and the boy will return. Now, if Abraham never thought that Isaac could have been raised from the dead, he would have said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the only one returning. Isaac would have caught on and said, I don't think I want to take that hike today, Dad. But see, even their own father, their own father, they called him, that they looked to, even he believed in the resurrection. Even he looked beyond. And in a sense, they were actually going against their own beliefs. They were calling the things that Abraham believed in demonic, even though they said they believed in the things that Abraham believed in. And it's crazy how, many, how so many people will speak for God, yet in fact are speaking against God. Again, maybe you've encountered people like this. Well, the Lord told me that um, it's okay um, for me to do this sin. Well, that's weird because in his word, which he said will last forever, <laughs> says that that's a, that's a sin and that no one should do that. Well, he, 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 took, he came to me personally and, and told me. No. In 1 Kings 13, there's an interesting story of a man of God and a prophet. In it, God told the man of God not to eat any bread, nor drink any water, nor go with anyone in that place. And in fact, when he, uh, when he went to the king, the king said, you know, and he gave, the man of God gave the king a, a prophecy. And um, the king's like, well, let me eat, you know, stay here and eat. And he goes, nope, I'm not going to even go back the same way I came. I'm going a different way to go back home. And I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to stay with anyone I'm not going to drink water and the prophet this old prophet again we're not given the names of these guys the prophet finds out that there's a man of God in the country he goes to him and says hey you should stay at my house eat and drink come with me the man of God says no God told me I shouldn't go with anyone and then the prophet says something very interesting the prophet says well I had an angel of the Lord come visit me and he told me to invite you in and to have you over for dinner and the man of God ended up listening and believing this man, this, this prophet, because, I mean, he, he probably might have even known that this guy was a prophet in his time. And I'm so, oh, well, I mean, the Lord told me not to, but he's also a prophet, and he, he's saying that the Lord told him to. So, well, I'm, I'm just going to go with him, because maybe the Lord changed his mind. Well, because he did that, um, after the man of God left the prophet's house, a lion um, came on the, on the in the road and attacked him, and uh, God sent the lion to to kill him. Um, and actually, God used the prophet that lied to uh, to tell the man of God that because you didn't listen to the word of the Lord originally, that you were going to die. Very interesting. First Kings thirteen. I, I, you should go read that later on today. It's a very interesting story. Um, how it all happens. The lion, the lion kills him but leaves his donkey and the lion just stands there um, next to his body as people walk by and see it. And the lion doesn't act ill towards anyone else. It's very interesting. I, I love the books of the Kings and the Chronicles. Some crazy things happen in those books. Um, you know, it's be some good movies made from those books. <laughs> Anyways, back to, back to the text. And then Jesus ends the conversation with, with a phrase that he knew would cause them great turmoil. Verse 58, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And when he said that, they knew exactly what he was saying. They knew exactly what he meant. And he wasn't trying to hide it either. He wasn't like, before Abraham was, you know. No, he wanted to make it 
clear and plain that Jesus, that he was saying, I am God. I am the same one that was in the burning bush that called Moses to go free the people from Israel. I am the same God that called Abraham out and promised him this great land. And how do we know that they knew this? <laughs> Verse 59, they took up stones to throw at him. In their minds, this was blasphemy. And, and if Jesus was not God, this would have been blasphemy. So yes, they were zealous and they knew the law. They could quote it. And they were at temple every Saturday. And, uh, you know, they gave a lot of money. At least they thought they did. And they were great men. And Yet we see their intentions are to kill, or to murder. And see, Jesus says this before this happens. He said, you're trying to kill me before this happens. You're trying. Not, you're going to try to kill me. He says, you're trying to kill me. You're trying to set me up in a trap. You're trying to get me to lie. You yourselves are lying because your father is the father of lies, the devil. And so in closing this morning, we must ask ourselves, what kind of fruit do we bear? If you claim to be a child of God, do you produce fruit? Do you produce God fruit? And Jesus says the only way that we can produce fruit from the Father is to be rooted in His Word, abide in His Word. The word abide it means to make your home with, to make comfortable with. There's a lot of Christians now, Christians nowadays, that are uncomfortable with the Word of God. Ah, it's old, it's, in, it's antique, it's offensive. I don't think that's what God meant. Or, you know, that was, that was man writing for God and they messed it up. And man, you know, I, even this week I heard someone at my work telling me that, you know, well, we know that, that the Bible is just, you know, it's been tainted by, by man. I don't know that. You show me. And this was a, a believer too. And I always wonder what they believe in. If you don't believe in the word of God. But are you listening to God or are you listening to men pretend to be God? To be from God? And you watch the, the TV, you know, the, the Christian TV channel and all these guys. I'm, a, I'm a, a speaker for the Lord. I speak for the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. And then you read your Bible and you're like, well, he never said that. If you would, turn with me to John 15 in closing tonight, um, or this morning. I didn't preach that long. It's not hardy nighttime. John 15. First 11 verses. Jesus talking about abide, abiding in Him. Verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away. And every branch that, he, that bears fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branch. branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Jesus is just very clear here. The only way to bear fruit, to do anything, is to abide in him. And as he said there, and when we cross-reference John 8, what we learned this morning, abiding in his word. 
That's how we bear fruit. That's our philosophy here at this church. That's why we stick to the Word of God. Because we know by the Word of God we'll bear much fruit. You know, they're, they're, that's how we do it here. <laughs> that's what I'll say. We focus on the disciples. And yes, we reach out to the lost. But our main goal is, is, is building up the body. Feeding the sheep. Healthy sheep reproduce. And that should be every single one of our goals. To be fed. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You, know, you won't have healthy sheep who diet on Kit Kats and Reese's. You know? They have to eat sheep food. Whatever that is. Grass, I think. Our food is the word of God. And you might try and eat this junk, the other junk, but you're going to get sick. You're not going to reproduce. You're not going to bear fruit. So my encouragement to you this morning is, is we have this. We're blessed to have this. We talked about this before, how, uh, how there's, there's countries today that people don't have this, let alone, I mean... Probably most of us have at least two copies, right? Plus our phones. We are blessed to have this. More than we can imagine. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't doubt, and I'm not trying to make a prophecy or anything, but I wouldn't doubt in the near future that even in our own country, this becomes something that we might not get to have. Legally, that is. But feast upon the word of God. He's got a buffet for us. I think they say that if, if you try and read, read the Bible cover to cover without stopping, it takes you like a day and a half, two days. So there's a lot to feast on <laughs> in, this, in this book. So my encouragement to you is to eat. Lord, I thank you so much, Lord, that you've given us the food we need, Lord, to be healthy to abide in you, to produce fruit. Lord, I pray that we would look at our lives right now. We would all examine ourselves and, and, and see what kind of fruit we're producing. Are we claiming to be from God or a child of God and yet the fruit we produce is sin, is evil, is actually of the Father, the devil? Glorifying ourselves? Or are we glorifying you, producing your fruit because we're abiding in your word? Lord, I pray that we would make your word our foundation, our main course, and our anchor. Lord, there's so many things today that try and pull us away from it, try and get us to go to the right or the left. Lord, but as you've already declared, that heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will by no means pass away. We thank you for giving us that eternal word. For, for, for preserving that eternal word. I pray you would just fill us with your spirit as we leave this place this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen.